Hi there, and welcome back. Now I'm going to give you kind of an overview of the process that you will engage in when you're building and evaluating a model. And you'll see sort of an overview of that iterative process. And I'll point to some aspects of this process that we really won't be able to get to substantially in this very short introduction to text mining that occurs within this course. But I really want you to have a picture in your head of what the, the whole process looks like. So I'm going to give you that high level overview of the process. I'm hoping that you'll gain an awareness of what it is that makes text mining distinct as a form of data mining. And also gain awareness of some of the important methodological issues for avoiding overfitting. Overfitting is where you um, build a model that's really too particular to the data that you have trained it on in such a way that you don't get good generalization to new data that you want to apply your model to. Um, that can happen in lots of different ways. And to some extent, models are always particular to the data that you train them on. Uh, if the data that you train them on is representative of the data that you plan to use for testing, then you should get pretty good generalizability. It's always the case that if the data is substantially different, you run into problems. But sometimes you have more problems than you should. And it's those cases where overfitting is problematic and should be avoided. And it can be avoided with good methodology. In general, that methodology is about keeping a very careful separation between train and test. There's lots of ways in which you can accidentally overstep this boundary, and I want to kind of raise your sensitivity to some of those issues. If you were taking a more extensive course in data mining, you would talk about this over and over again throughout that course and gain more and more sensitivity to the multitude of ways you can accidentally overstep. I just want to raise your awareness to that issue so that you'll know that that's an important area to poke further into if you decide to take steps beyond this short introduction uh, in, in your ongoing work. So it all starts with the raw text, and it's the fact that we have this raw textual data as our starting place that makes this area distinct. We extract features from that text with some awareness of the structure of language and what it is that we're trying to capture. From those features, we build a model. And at this stage, building a model from a, a set of features is just like any other area of machine learning. Here, what we're doing in text mining becomes just like um, whatever you learned in Ryan Baker's unit. Because once you have represented the data in a tabular form, as, with each instance being a vector of features, building the model at that point is, is kind of domain independent. It's the part before that. It's preparing to build the model that's particular to the form of data mining that you're doing, the area of data mining. And so the goal of the kinds of models that we'll be talking about in this unit is classification. There are lots of different kinds of models you might look at. Some of them uh, don't make a specific prediction about a category, but can tell you whether data that you see is similar to data that has been trained on in the past. Does it fit the model that was learned over a corpus. Sometimes you're trying to predict something specific, but it isn't a category. Instead, it's a number. And then we can look at you know, the range of numbers that we get. How does that range of numbers relate to the range of numbers that um, we had as our gold standard for that data? So there are different kinds of models that you can talk about. In this unit specifically, we're talking about classification. So there are models that take an instance of data that's one vector of features that you have extracted and return a classification, one of a finite set of values. Now, in our work on the representation, what we want to discover is how to represent the data so that instances with the same categorization look similar to one another, and instances with different class values or different categorizations look different. Now, sometimes when we represent our data, we don't do this effectively. And instances that should be classified differently look very similar to the algorithms. 
or things that should be classified similarly look very different. And both of these kinds of problems end up causing the models to do misclassifications. It's especially difficult when you have some categories that are very closely related to one another and so that the distinctions between them are very nuanced and difficult to capture. The only way to do this effectively is to make sure that the set of features that you have lend themselves to making appropriate distinctions. That when you look at the data through the lens of these features that you have extracted, that you can see clearly those categories. Now, sophisticated machine learning algorithms are able to do a better job than simple ones at finding structure where it at least exists within the features that you have given, but not in a very simple way, not in a straightforward way, not in an obvious way. But there's only so far that can go, that the algorithms can't really compensate for severe weaknesses in your representation. It's like that candy that we talked about in the first lecture. If you bleach your candy white, it doesn't matter how sophisticated your machine learning algorithm is, you will not be able to learn a model that makes the distinctions effectively. So a lot of the work in text mining and other areas of data mining is on representation. You have to know what it is about the data that you want to preserve so that those instances that should be classified the same look similar and those instances that should be classified differently look different. So how do you get started along this path? Well, we already looked at a very simple example when we were talking about the statement versus question example. And we're going to talk in this lecture um, a little bit about, uh, you know, get going deeper. And there's going to be an example in a subsequent lecture. In that lecture, what you're going to do is actually look at some examples and to make some observations. We're going to point to some things that you might notice in that data. But for now, what I want to do is talk to you about how you set yourself up for doing that qualitative analysis. So you will set aside some data that's specifically for the purpose of looking closely at. And I talked to you a little bit about overfitting. Now, you, you are very much in danger of overfitting if you spend a lot of time looking closely at the data that you're going to build and test models on. So you want to set aside some data that's specifically for looking closely at that you will not use either for training or for testing. We're going to call this the development data. And in that data, you can start to look at uh, examples from each of the categories that you want your model to be able to distinguish between. And then start to ask yourself, what do you notice that makes them look different? And once you get an idea of what those features are that appear to distinguish instances from different classes, you can start to think about how you can extract those features from the raw text to build these vectors of features that you can then apply a machine learning algorithm to. So just as a very, very important point that I'm going to continue to emphasize, you want to do this up-close look in this data that you neither train nor test on. And again, we're going to call this our development set. You don't want to be too familiar with the data that you train and test on. Okay, so in general, separate the data that you're going to use for evaluation from the data that you use for exploration. The exploration data we're calling the development set. We'll refer to the evaluation set, the one for training and testing, as the cross-validation set. And in Brian Baker's unit, he talked to you about cross-validation and how that works. So I will not repeat that here. You should also set aside a third data set, one that you never look at until you think you're done. And the reason is that it is possible, even if you make a very careful separation between your development data and your cross-validation data, that in iteratively working on your model and trying to improve it and continually testing and comparing with performance on that cross-validation set, that you can still be kind of indirectly getting a little bit too much familiarity with exactly that set that you're using as your cross-validation set. So when you think you're done, what you want to do is do that cross-validation to see how you're doing on your cross-validation set, then 
train a model over your whole cross-validation set and apply that model to your final test set, and then see how much of a drop of performance do you get between the performance that you got on that final test set you had never looked at and what you're getting in your cross-validation. And if the drop is not too big, then you were successful in avoiding overfitting. But if it's a huge drop, then you probably made some methodological error along the way. So here is kind of a, a schematic overview of that process. So first, you set aside your development data, and you do a qualitative analysis on that development data. It will give you ideas for features that you should extract, and you'll extract those features from your cross-validation data and do a cross-validation to evaluate how well that model is doing. And then you have to ask yourself, do you like that performance value? Do you think it's good enough? If you do, then you're done. But usually, that never happens on the first round. So what you want to do at that point is what's called an error analysis. Now LightSide, the tool bench that we'll use in this unit, has special support for helping you do an error analysis, but we won't have time in this short unit to get into the details of how to actually do that. So I'm going to just point out to you where in the process you would do that. You can start to get familiar with it if you look at the user's manual that comes along with LightSide. And you can start to play around with it, and you can look for opportunities to get further instruction beyond this course if you want to be able to um, get more deeply into that. So at this point, you would do that error analysis. In general, at a high level, what I will say about error analysis is that you should train a model on your cross-validation data, apply it to your development data, and then look at where the errors are occurring on the development data and start to understand what's going wrong by looking at that. And so again, it's your cross, it, it's your close-up work that you're doing on that development data, not on your cross-validation data. So once you have done that error analysis, it will give you more insight into what you missed the first time you were extracting features from your data. You'll get new ideas about features you might extract that are richer, that are more effective at making things that are similar look similar, and making things that are different look different. And when you have those ideas and you augment your feature space, <clears throat> then you do cross-validation again with that new set of features over your cross-validation set, and you look at the performance value. Is it better? Is it worse? If it's acceptable now, you're done. If not, you'll enter back into that cycle of error analysis and improvement and reevaluation, and you keep on cycling until you're happy with the result, and then you're done. So, please keep this in mind. Because eventually, if you go further, you will learn how to do an error analysis, and you will be engaging in this iterative process, because it's almost never the case that whatever you try first works as well as you'd like it to. Machine learning is not uh, magic. And I, I want you to know that there is a process here, that it's a partnership between the developer and the algorithms so that you won't get discouraged if you don't like the performance that you see at first. There's really a process of working with the data and taking ideas and being very problem driven. That's an important part of doing this work. So the development data that you set aside up front, you will use for qualitative analysis before you ever even start using machine learning. You'll also use it as error analysis and for gaining ideas for design of new kinds of features. And the cross-validation data you will use for gauging your performance throughout this process. So every time you're ready to check where you're at, you will do the evaluation over that cross-validation set. Since it's the same data each time, you can measure your progress by comparing from time to time what your performance looks like. So as I've said before, keep in touch, uh, not just with me, but with your fellow students, and I wish you all the best of luck as you continue your journey in this class.